Hello, everyone. Can everybody see me? Hi, um, welcome to day two. Uh, we're so happy to have all of you here and seeing so many people coming into the session. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I couldn't be, you know, happier to have this amazing panel of experts coming today, um, joining us to talk about philanthropy and the pursuit of the common good. And it's a pleasure of mine to introduce you to my dear friend, Judith Simmons, um, joining us from Paris. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Judith about three years ago. And, you know, I, I feel that every year that we see each other and we talk about the power of collective giving and the possibilities of bringing so many more people into philanthropy, you know, we, we could be talking for hours. So it is um, my honor to, to leave you here with Judith, who will introduce us to Bruce and to Greg. Um, please, please, we're not going to go over the bias of these amazing speakers, but make sure you go to our website and, and read about this dynamic trio. Thank you, Judith. Um, I think Judith, you're on mute. I am mute, yes. No, now, now we can hear you, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, fine. So I just, I was just thanking Sarah for her kind words and congratulations for uh, making philanthropy together such a force since its inception. Um, I'm honored to start by introducing my colleagues. Uh, in this adventure today, Bruce Sievers, Sievers and Gregory Witowski. You will find their full bios, as Sarah said, on the, uh, on the website. Uh, but I'll just say a few words so you'll know um, what, what you're getting, I guess. Bruce is a visiting scholar at the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society and a lecturer in political science at Stanford University, among many other activities. He's been CEO of the Walter and Elise Haas Fund, and he was appointed to the National Council on the Humanities by Barack Obama in 2013. Among his many distinguished publications is the book, which you will all want to read after the session, I hope, Civil Society, Philanthropy, and the Fate of the Commons. And he is a co-founder of our uh, a PCG initiative. Uh, Gregory Witowski is a senior lecturer uh, on uh, nonprofit management and uh, affiliate faculty at the National Center for Disaster at Columbia University. I think it's rather appropriate to have him here. In addition to other activities, he's launching a book series with Georgetown University Press on philanthropy nonprofit and non-governmental organizations. And he's a very active member uh, of the PCG initiative. Uh, the third introduction is of what is the pursuit of the common good initiative. Um, it's uh, an institution which seeks to demonstrate how achieving the common good can be essential to build back better, which we hear a lot about these days, but build back an equitable and sustainable future and how it relates to collective giving. So we'll stay on this slide. Uh, we're here today to explore with you the key aspects of the common good in different contexts, uh, some hypotheses and challenges for operationalizing it. Um, we'll talk more about that and making and restoring a sense of the common good in our multiple communities. Uh, we also uh, uh, will look at the synergies and the shared values that we have, it has with and how it relates uh, to collective giving. Um, 
so we can we uh, we can uh, and we believe that really the timing uh, is is now because if you read your papers and look, look at speeches from people from Darren Walker on up or down, uh, everyone is realizing our critical systemic challenges and there are repeated calls to restore the common good, which we hope to show is not a state of being, but a collaborative process. Next slide, please. We are a multi-sector uh, international uh, initiative. We're uh, working on new research and learning infrastructure to change the way we, we teach and think about how we work together. We may be a movement one day, uh, which would aims to restore a sense of the uh, common good uh, to contemporary society and facilitate the resolution of wicked global and local challenges that we talked about before. So, next slide. Next slide. One of our, the um, emerging hypothesis and some findings lead us to believe that this underlying concept, the common good, is a contested idea negotiated in different contexts, yet one which stands as an essential normative goal, and that the pursuit of the common good is fundamental to progress towards, so am I not, uh, uh, toward solutions for this vital set of wicked problems from environmental breakdown, uh, perverse economic incentives, and uh, income inequality, as well as our dysfunctions in government and civil society, among others. Uh, next one. Ah. And now it's, it's uh, a pleasure to turn it over uh, to, to Bruce, who will uh, certainly increase your understanding through his research and uh, and thinking. Bruce, it's up to you. Thank you, Judith. I uh, just want to say what a delight it is to be here today uh, talking with uh, this group of people from actually around the world, I guess, um, about the common good and its relationship to philanthropy. Um, the giving circles, uh, I haven't personally participated in the giving circle, but my understanding of the field is that Giving circles in some ways uh, illustrate the centrality of the common good norm to philanthropy in general. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, uh, the common good, I would suggest, and actually argue this in, in the book that Judith referred to, is one of four defining norms um, of the of of, of philanthropy, the constitutive norms of philanthropy and civil society, um, uh, the one of the standard uh, descriptions of philanthropy is voluntary action for the public good, and that certainly encompasses the idea of um, of the common good. Um, in many ways, I I would suggest that giving circles is um, mm. a kind of microcosm for how philanthropy uh, strives to bring private interpretations of, of the good into common agreement. Um, so in addition to the four norms, which I would suggest are common good, individual rights, and tolerance, um, three norms actually, um, there are four institutional components of civil society, and that is, um, the rule of law or legal systems, um, philanthropy as a, as a support structure for civil society, um, a system of free expression that is how, how society communicates with itself, and, um, and the idea of a free press, and then of course private associations, which are the main bodies that uh, operate in the, in the arena of of uh, civil society. Uh, we in the US 
tend to call them the nonprofit sector, but they're, they're a wide variety of private associations that, that fall into this arena. Um, so could we have the first slide, please? Uh, I just want to suggest that while the idea of the common good seems to be fairly straightforward, namely uh, the good of all opposed to in, as a, the goods as defined as a collection of individual interests, it really is very complex as I think if you think about it very much, you realize there are uh, various arenas in which um, the um, difficulty and the, the complexity of the idea of the common good become transparent. So in the logical arena, there is uh, the idea of say a transcendent con concept of, of, uh, of uh, what the idea of the common good is, uh, something that is broader to the whole society, or is it an aggregation of individual uh, interests, individual uh, good, individual goods. In the ethical arena, the question arises, does the common good imply the idea of altruism or is it essentially enlightened self-interest like Adam Smith suggested? Um, in the sociological arena, there's the question of the un underlying ethos of community um, uh, or th that is the idea of generalized reciprocity or uh, the libertarian pursuit of individual rights. And this, this you can go back to the early sociologists and describe uh, how that difference can, uh, can appear. Um, in the economic arena, uh, the idea of the common good uh, raises the idea of how should costs and benefits of pursuing the common good be allocated. So uh, there's the famous concept of the stag hunt that some economists talk about, which is, let's say a village is trying to, uh, to, to uh, hunt a, a stag that is in a nearby forest. So they make a giant circle around it, around where they think it is. And then uh, at some point, a rabbit hops by. And um, then the individual participant in the circle has to decide whether they're going to stay and go after the, the common good interest, which is the uh, staying and, and potentially capturing the stag or going breaking the circle, going after the rabbit, which is a sure thing, uh, but will prevent the entire group from achieving its goal. So that's an example of the economic issues. And then the political issue, um, the question is what is government uh, versus civil society's role in pursuing the common good? Is there a tension with liberty in talking about collective goals versus uh, individual goals? So I just suggest those as, as the arenas in which uh, the complexity of this, this concept comes up, yet uh, we still want to say that it's, um, that it's a, uh, an important uh, transcendent concept that is fundamentally important to the, to the nature of a civil society and to philanthropy. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the, um, the question of uh, are there uh, fundamental barriers beneath all these various complexities that arise as um, as definitive of the of the uh, of the, the process of, of working toward the common good, um, to um, the the first in the first arena, I want to say that there is this uh, problem of collective action. That's a familiar one to people that study this field. That is the difference between, uh, um, say in the first uh, contemporary formulation or first or one of the first in the modern era uh, in Man Mansur Olson's book, The Logic of Collective Action. And he argues that typically rational self-interested individuals um, uh, will, uh, let me move this over a little bit. Um, you, uh, 
will not obtain a common or group interest unless they are a very small group who, who know each other or are coerced to do so. And another way to describe this is individual rationality is not sufficient for collection, collective rationality. That's uh, in a book by uh, Sandler in 1992. Um, and the problem here with collective action has been very closely related to the problem of the free rider, which means individuals can benefit from collective action without necessarily incurring the costs to produce it. So that's the sort of number one um, illustration of the challenge of collective action, uh, the problem of collective action. Uh, and what is, what should be apparent is the common interests of the whole group um, uh, becomes uh, uh, undermined by um, the tendency for individual and rational tendencies for individuals to seek their self-interest. Um, so you have essentially uh, two fundamental problems related to uh, achieving the common good. One is this logical problem, and can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so this is just a quick illustration of one of the standard ways of, of showing problem of collective action. So this is the prisoner's dilemma. And many of you may be familiar with this. I'm not gonna go through the, how, how it works, but fundamentally, it means that uh, in this case, you have two people that are arrested that don't know each other. Um, they're, they're accused of the same crime. And this, this doesn't have anything to do with whether somebody actually committed the crime or not. The question is, what is your best strategy to get the lowest prison sentence? And so, um, the prosecutor uh, talks to all of them, or both of them, and um, the idea is that uh, he just wants a conviction of one sort or another, and the, the best outcome in, in terms of the two people would be for them both to <clears throat> remain silent, but the way it's presented to each of them is that um, it, it seems to be in their best personal interest to confess. And then, but if both of them confess, they both end up getting five years. If they, if they both remain silent, they each get one year. But the, but the fact that there's no trust be, between them so leads to the conclusion that they both end up with the, with, uh, the five-year sentences instead of the one-year sentence. And next slide, please. The, the, the other uh, typical illustration of this uh, the dilemma in this arena uh, is um, when you have uh, of a, a commons field where the cows are grazing, you can see all the cows are happy because there's just one cow for each, uh, with each owner. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the, what's what happens here though the typical incentive is for one of the, one of the farmers around the edge there gets the bright idea of adding one more cow and by adding that cow as you can see it just de deteriorates the commons by one six so he's not losing much but he's he's doubling his income but what what does that do the incentive to everyone around the circle is to add one more cow. And of course, what that leads to is the destruction of the commons in general. So those are two illustrations where the, 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 the benefit to all is clear. That is, they, they all um, are um, uh, operate in accordance with, uh, with uh, um, um, leading to their collective benefit, uh, they they still should be able to see that, but it, the problem is the nature of the individual interest versus collective interest defeats that. So that's one side of this. If there's a clear, uh, obvious collective goal, but nevertheless, the logic of the situation moves in the other direction. So then the other, there's the other major question that has to do with the, the problem of uh, pursuing a common good or collective action. And that is the idea where there are fundamentally different worldviews that are coming into interaction with each other. So that's the next slide. Um, 
So this is the situation becomes even more difficult when there are fundamentally different conceptions of the common good. Uh, in a case where people might have very different value systems, such as uh, religious views and so on, that is the situation where there needs to be ongoing dialogue. Um, for instance, suggested by someone like Jürgen Habermas, the philosopher, and others who suggest that the ideal of undistorted communication uh, needs to be engaged in in order to reason together and, and come to, come up with an agreement with a, some kind of consensus about what the what the uh, collective good is. Um, so um, what I, I would just suggest is that giving circles actually have the goal of <clears throat> achieving the common good, but you all illustrate, uh, and I'm sure engage in processes where you um, are um, de developing a, a kind of model for philanthropy. Um, so absent a, a single donor's vision and founding, say, a foundation or some kind of rigorous voting process, the question is, uh, how do you come up with pursuing uh, your agreed upon goals and then move uh, toward that by putting resources that you have collectively toward it? So the question is, how do you arrive at consensus? Um, and that illustrates, as I said, I think the, in the microcosm, the, the challenge to philanthropy of uh, arriving at common goals uh, through individual voluntary action. So I'll hand it over to you, Greg, to show us how we get there. Thanks, Bruce, and, and thanks to um, Philanthropy Together for, uh, for hosting us and to Judith for such a nice uh, introduction. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to talk a little bit about today is um, the way in which we move forward in terms of understanding the common good and pursuing it. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about division today in our world and, and uh, philanthropy is one of the means where potentially we can come together to look beyond ourselves, beyond ourselves as individuals and have some sense of community and of societal needs. And so uh, that's a real, um, a real goal for, uh, for the um, Pursuing the Common Good initiative. And one that I wanna talk a little bit about, this is some research that I started on uh, classes and we can move to the next slide um, that give uh, grant money. And so in a lot of ways, this is a kind of collective giving model similar to uh, similar to, um, to giving circles. And, and when we think about this, we can think about two separate ways of doing this. Well, uh, you know, one is of course, the actual money can be uh, given for a, a, a collective action. Um, so the kind of causes that you advance can be those that help to create an understanding of a common good. So support for organizations or programs. Um, especially moving outside of yourself and your circle, that is the identities that you have, giving circles, some of the research that we've seen, um, uh, Julia Carboni, Angie Eigenberry has done some work in which they show that people, there is both an increase in giving sort of to similar self identities, um, but also an increase in giving to uh, people and causes of different identities. And so the notion of giving collectively itself seems to matter. And that's the second piece that I wanna talk about today in this research on classes, which is the process of giving. And the fact that the process of philanthropically giving together um, can really uh, create an understanding uh, within ourselves of other needs. And so this listening consensus building that results from this process of giving collectively, I think is really important as well. And so moving on to the uh, next slide, um, this study looks at uh, experiential philanthropy courses, um, which are courses in which students come together to grant money uh, to causes locally. Um, I, I won't read out the definition of it, but you see it there. These are on the rise in terms of in higher education and they're funded by a number of different organizations, probably the two largest in terms of those that have networks and partnerships are the Learning by Giving Foundation and uh, the Meyerson Foundation. Meyerson uh, grants just through the University of Northern Kentucky, but they have a pretty extensive um, group of courses they support, whereas Learning by Giving grants uh, through 
anywhere between 30 and 40 uh, colleges and universities and tend to focus on, um, on the uh, uh, grant making courses. And so the study that uh, I was involved in and had two co-authors, if we move to the next slide, uh, looked at courses um, uh, funded by the Learning by Giving Foundation. So while this wasn't funded, our study wasn't funded by the Learning by Giving Foundation, they were our partners. And the two co-authors on this study are my colleague from uh, Columbia, Erlen De Leon, and a colleague from Indiana, Julie Hatcher. Uh, we distributed a pre and post test to students. Uh, so at the beginning of the semester and at the end to get a sense of what they had learned through this giving process. And just to give you some sense of the, of the course structure, students would come in and they'd come in with their passions for whatever cause it was that they really wanted to support. You know, these were self-selecting students. They were engaged and excited about creating change. And so one of the toughest things about it was getting them to agree on what to do. And so, um, so this process of collectively giving was really, I think, an important part of their learning, learning process because they came to realize that their passions were important, but so were other people's passions. And we'll see that reflected in the data that we, that we see in the pre and post test. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, we can begin to see some of that, uh, some of that being reflected. So um, here, uh, the, the sort of some of the quantitative results, 93% reported the cost taught them a great deal about current social issues. So they did learn about problems, um, learned about valuing diversity within their community. As you can see there, nine out of 10. 87% um, said that deliberating, debating and reaching consensus with others taught them a lot. The courses varied a little bit in terms of requiring actual consensus or requiring um, a uh, uh, more than a majority, a sort of super majority. Um, but in all cases, they needed to make some sort of agreement um, regarding who to fund. 86% uh, said they developed uh, um, ties to the community and 83% reported interacting with community members taught them a great deal. So the, so the process here, you know, this has, has no reference to what cause they supported. Uh, the process here was an important part of how they uh, learned over that course of the semester. And so I'm leaving out the fact that they also did learn, you know, some skills about grant making, uh, reading 990s, all that exciting stuff. Uh, this is really kind of focusing on the process, but they learned some other skills along the way as well. If we can go to the next slide, please. So this gives you some sense in the pre and post tests, and obviously there's still some um, some room for growth there. But still, in you know, in, in the course of one semester, this is pretty substantial growth in their um, in 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 their skills related to listening, related to understanding other viewpoints, and related to uh, consensus making. And here you can see their ability to participate in, in uh, group discussions going from 16 to uh, 46%, ability to articulate their own viewpoint. And this varied quite a bit. I, you know, I've taught a number of these classes. Some students came in very active and comfortable participating. Others showed really great gains in terms of that. Um, and then uh, consensus making, and you can see they're going from 12% to 42%. Um, I was pretty, you know, having even taught these courses, I was pretty astounded by some of those, uh, some of those responses. So, you know, the process of working together, listening to each other, making a, a, a consensus decision seemed to uh, play out um, and having an impact on them. Uh, next slide, please. So I have a couple of just, uh, you know, sort of uh, qualitative data here in which they talked about what they learned. Um, and you can see some of these. Uh, these are pretty representative, uh, so I did pick some out, but the, I think they're representative of broader trends in terms of how people wrote about the, the course. And as you can see, really a key element of both listening and speaking. Um, so they learned to kind of be able to make an argument that would appeal to others, but also to listen closely to their colleagues and classmates, um, you know, recognizing, I, I find this last one, really important that they, the recognizing that their peers also were passionate about what they wanted to support and then figuring out how to kind of um, come together on that. And so I think that's a really uh, important piece there as well. Uh, next slide, please. And so this final piece about consensus building, um, you know, again, the, the question of, of passion and, and, you know, having been in the middle of some of these conversations, I, I, I know just how, um, 
how excited they were about particular organizations and causes. Um, and so, you know, as you see here, 20 to 25 people coming together to agree on one universal organization. Um, not always getting complete agreement, uh, which is true. Some people abstain from voting in the end, um, but um, you know you would have those cases in which people were to come to agreement. And as you see, it helped me uh, become more empathetic towards others when dealing with conflict. And I, I kind of like this closing one of, I can't always get what I want, but I can still be included in something great. And I think that sense that um, through this process, people can understand uh, the needs of others, and, and this is not, of course, just the needs of those that they're supporting with the money, but this is those of the needs that they're working together with. And I think that's really an important piece of, um, you know, how collective giving, and this is something that you and giving circles are engaged in, how that can really matter in terms of advancing an, uh, an understanding of a common good, an understanding of needs outside of yours, um, and needs that are, you uh, close and, and important for your community. And so um, so just that's some of the data there. I think that's the end of my uh, formal presentation, but we looking forward to uh, engaging with your questions and talking some more. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Judith, go ahead. I'm sorry. I Just before you go, I was going to thank Greg, particularly for giving us some of the evidence to back up all of the concepts that uh, and illustrations that Bruce was giving. Um, before I give it to Sarah, who must is sort of chomping at the bit with all your questions, I I'd like to ask uh, a couple of questions myself to get us going, um, and perhaps Greg, you can uh, look at this one and and maybe let Bruce comment a bit too because he is. He has been teaching these experiential uh, courses as well. So what do you think, uh, first Greg, and maybe some Bruce, what is the role of higher education in advancing the common good as a norm? Thanks, Judith. Yeah, I, you know, I think we can, when we think about higher education, we can think about these experiential philanthropy courses. I do think they're really, um, uh, can show dramatic gains, but I, but I honestly, I think more broadly that what a higher education does, especially in, in education generally, is it does get us to think beyond ourselves, right? That we're, we're mm -hmm. part of a larger cause and a larger society. Um, you know, you read literature to get other perspectives and points of view to understand, um, uh, you know, that there are other uh, ways of doing things. There are other worlds even, right, in a lot of literature. Mm -hmm. And so, I think having that kind of broader understanding of um, being beyond yourself and outside of yourself is really an essential part of what education can do. And you know, as I as I say, I think the the experiential philanthropy course really can connect on a practical level to a lot of that as well. And so I I see both real gains to be had on the broader um, issues as well as through the course. Bruce. Bruce, do you have any comments that you want to make to actually saying? What was the question? About what, what is the role of higher education uh, in advancing? And, and from your experience teaching the same sort of courses. Yeah, I've had quite a really rewarding experience teaching uh, teaching experiential philanthropy courses over the last six or seven years. I will say um, that one of, one of the uh, comments that the founder of this program, that is uh, <clears throat> Jeffrey Rayner in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, so was, I, I don't know what it is about the Dallas Fort Worth area, but they seem to be very very good on philanthropy, but. Um, They've been making these grants to universities around the around the country, and uh, I will say that it has been a real um, eye opener for me in teaching the course. That when you go beyond theory and just and get into the practical issues of having to decide on common uh, a common agreement on grantees, because people's ideas about what should be done with with uh, philanthropic money vary hugely. Um, but it's been um, it's been a really rewarding experience, as I say, in terms of of, uh, of seeing uh, how students evolve over 
the course of the, the period of the course in coming to agreement and in understanding the complexity of each of these issues. And I would agree with Greg, I think um, that I mean, it certainly is a is a topic that belongs in in uh, university curricula. Um, the as I was saying, the, the founder of this program, uh, one of his mantra phrases is that universities around the country teach hundreds of courses in how to make money, but generally no courses or maybe one course in how to give it away. And um, it is um, there are lots of complexities in terms of. Uh, making decisions about common uh, agendas, but uh, I, I think it's been an incredibly uh, important uh, experience, and I, I would highly recommend it to uh, others in, in other university settings. Thank you. Well, let, let's turn it over to Sarah, and, and maybe I'll come in a, a little later with another question. Sarah? Um, yes, I just want to encourage everyone to send your questions through the chat or through the Q&A. Uh, I've seen that Bob is asking, can you tell us more about how these classes are structured? And also, Greg, if you were willing to share your evaluation. I think I saw it there on the on the chat. Sure. So um, in terms of the, the evaluation, just reach out um, by email. That's probably easiest um, and happy to... Uh, I'm not actually sure. It's, we, we did the survey in 2014, so I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure uh, um, exactly where, where it is right now in terms of uh, whether what form I can share it with you, but I'll be happy to if I can. Um, the, uh, uh, the question about the organization of the courses, uh, the, um, I think right now what we're looking at uh, in terms of the different ones that we included in the, in the uh, uh, survey there are five different uh, universities and colleges involved. And so they were slightly different in their organization, but essentially what happened is uh, students would come together and, and either create a mission statement or a type of program orientation. Um, they would then uh, actually write up RFPs that went out to uh, get submissions back. When I taught the course, uh, we collaborated with the local United Way, so we had, could have a pretty quick turnaround time um, in terms of getting submissions back. Uh, so we did have a somewhat limited pool of potential applicants. Uh, other people have done it where it's wide open. Um, so it really kind of varies a little bit there. Um, but then it comes down to you do an analysis, you do site visits, it's you know all that uh, process throughout. Um, you know, of, of the applications and, and so on. So we would have uh, finalists, you know, kind of a first cut, uh, do site visits, a second cut, and then, um, you know, make a decision. Some years students wanted to break up the money and other years they wanted to give it collectively. Um, yeah, usually that decision was made before uh, we even got into the process so that, you know, there, there wasn't a decision at the end of saying, oh, we should partition off this or that. Um, and I found that that helped in terms of Students recognizing they needed to come to some consensus, um, you know, and we talked about the impact that they could have. It was a $10,000 grant, so it's substantial for um, some of the communities where we were uh, involved. Uh, but once you begin uh, par parsing that out a bit more, it, um, you know, the work involved for a nonprofit to apply is such that, you know, we wanted to also be uh, respectful of that. So, so that's a little bit of background there. Um, you know, for me, while well, people uh, get their, their questions, for me, it's fascinating that, um, you know, to see the actual research about this, because we see in giving circles, uh, we have seen, you know, interfaith uh, giving circles, right? When you bring people with different religious views, uh, we, we have, you know, some cross-class, cross-race giving circles going on, too. Um, even in the within the same uh, identity groups, we see a lot of cross class giving mm -hmm. circles. So it's how you know uh, the collective giving field has been doing this for years, for generations. But the the fact that has not been recognized as you know as philanthropy, right? So I think there is a, a big opportunity for us and, and everyone that is, you know, joining us during this summit to, to really um, come as an example for maybe, you know, the, the traditional philanthropy on how to, to do, how we are all, you know, um, pushing the common good um, 
and and kind of pushing uh, barriers, right? That that a lot of times um, are not um, that easy to push in 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 more traditional philanthropy. Um, I see I see a, a question here. Um, as a recent college grad, I'd love to know if you feel that courses like this should be required for all incoming first years, for example, especially at schools that tend to have successful alumni. I would also love to know if you feel that we, there would be alumni coming back together and reparticipating in a course like this again. Hmm. Bruce, what do you think? Well, yeah, I, um, I do think uh, actually introducing kids, students to, to this early on is a good idea. There's also something to be said for doing it later on, which is what we, our class tends to be mostly juniors and seniors with a few graduate students because they've had the um, academic experience that can flow into it. So part of what we're, what my course is, is involves is this theory and practice together. So the, the conceptual questions that, that are, are, are behind this, some of this and some of this takes, therefore draws on people like John Locke and Hobbes and so forth. So that familiarity with those through prior courses in, in college is, is also useful. But it also can be done early on. I've seen some of had some very successful students who were freshmen and sophomores. And I will agree with the questioner about um, how important it is to uh, for students to get a sense of, of what this is all about because it's um, it's a, it's, a, it's a very valuable preparation for what they could be looking at later on in life. Uh, Greg, did you have a thought about that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's uh, usually it's the funding that prevents it from happening. So I'm glad I saw that you have a uh, session later about collaborating, um, giving circles in, with colleges, because, um, you know, the reality is, is uh, if you want to give the money locally, uh, doing so with the help of students is a great way to both give the money locally and have these kind of outcomes through students. So it's a great sort of collaborative idea. Um, one of the difficulties for a lot of colleges in terms of their development offices is, you know, they're not really looking for money to give to the community so much as money for themselves. And so, um, so that does sometimes provide some, um, conflict there. Uh, you know, the Learning by Giving Foundation has generally funded those partner organizations, um, but as they've sort of also tried to have the partners uh, raise some money as well, um, that is kind of a, a struggle for some colleges and universities because, you know, ultimately the money does not wind up in their, um, in their pockets. So they're, you know, well, I think they can see the, 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 the benefits of it in terms of learning outcomes. And again, the University of Northern uh, Kentucky is one to take a look at. They have, you know, you would sign up for a engineering course and you'd have a philanthropic giving component or you'd sign up for a, you know, a literature course and have that giving component. So they really do it across, um, across the curriculum. I'd like to add too that one thing it's 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 not only the, the process and the techniques that are important, but we found uh, this this fall in my course, which is not an experiential course, uh, that when we added the common good concept to the whole idea of social investment and and philanthropy, it really meant a lot to the to the students. I mean, we were really interested in how much they wanted to to look at the ethical issues. And, and look at, at how the uh, common good could, uh, pursuing the common good could influence uh, uh, really addressing major issues in a way that without this philosophical or conceptual input. And, and so I think that as much as you need to have the practical, which certainly brings out uh, a, a lot of the uh, conceptual and, and, and norm uh, challenges. You also need to, to look at not just why you give, but how you can solve problems and the common good, uh, look at the pursuit of the common good in some of the uh, case studies we've looked at is an illustration of how uh, 
you need to bring sectors and different types of people together to address things like climate change or to look at the shrimping, uh, declining media and that. So there, there is a, a, a real need to, to, I think, to insert this in, in, into the curriculum, whether you're going to be a philanthropist or not. Thank you. To, to Greg's point, I was just going to say that it's a kind of win-win for the college um, because not only do they they have good PR that go because of the, the organizations that they're funding in the community, but it's a great learning experience for the students. So it's a, it's a double win. Thank you. I know we have only two minutes. I know there's another question, but I know Judy, if you wanted to give some parting words and the panelists wants to want to give some parting words uh, for everyone. I, I, I think that if, if, if Bruce and, and um, Greg could each have some takeaway they'd like to suggest from this discussion. Uh, I'll turn it over uh, to the two of them. Bruce? Well, Greg, I think Greg is going to go first, right? Greg? Okay, great. Sure. Yeah, great. <laughs> sure. Um, well, and, and, and actually it works out, you know, I appreciate um, the comments that you both just made in terms of uh, how these uh, two pieces that we presented fit together. Um, you know, one of the, the, the way in which we came to do this study was actually that my colleague had a class on civil society right after mine in which mm -hmm. Bruce's book on the common good was used. Um, and students kept talking about, oh, that's kind of like what, how we do it in class. And so, you know, when we grant the money and, and so, um, you know, it kind of was an applied way of thinking about mm -hmm. topics like uh, civil society and the common good. And I think, you know, that's one of the things I guess I'm, I might say is, is my takeaway is how these two interact with one another that you do, yes. as Bruce says, need to have an understanding of some of the theory and some of the um, uh, broader societal needs. Mm -hmm. But then part of what we're here and talking about is, is how to advance those things. And so the supply nature, I think, is really important. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Bruce. And I think also that's why in putting the pursuit of the common good initiative together, that, that we really emphasize operationalizing the common good. It's not just a state of being, but how do you get there? And I think that that's where the, the process meets the, the theory. Bruce, I'm sorry. To yeah, I would just go back to the uh, opening where we were talking about how well giving circles illustrate exactly what we're talking about here, because it's not only do they do they do the practical work of philanthropy, but they should, they also demonstrate how the, how you overcome the challenge of coming together uh, with various ideas about what we each think about as the common good, which could be very different from each other. But how how, how the giving circles are able to uh, address that issue and come up with consensus. Uh, ideas and uh, implement the transmission of resources to important public problems. Couldn't be better said, thank you. I, th I think we want to thank you, Sarah, for this opportunity and uh, wish you good luck with the rest of this, this exciting summit and uh, hope we can see how the common good flourishes uh, with your initiatives. No, thank you so much, Greg, Bruce, Judith, to join, uh, for joining us. Uh, the pleasure was all ours to, to learn from you. Uh, and, you know, I encourage everybody to join us on the, the last week. We are going to continue the conversation with the Learning by Giving Foundation. We get the Community Investment Network and Honeycomb to, to learn about how they're involving uh, youth, uh, not only college students, but also, you know, uh, Generation Z in, into giving circles and giving. So thank you, thank you so much. And I think we're putting in the chat uh, the survey for the session if um, all our attendees can, um, can fill that out. So thank you so much, everyone. And, uh, and we'll see you tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern time for an amazing fireside chat with uh, Congresswoman uh, Pramila Yayapal and, um, and our friends from uh, SVP. Thank you.